Welcome to episode 199 of Level Up, 60 minutes of live Q&A where your questions drive the show. My name is Stefan Brendel, and on behalf of APMG, I'm your host today. We would like you to invite you to do something for us and something for yourself. If you're watching on YouTube, please do give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. It is free and helps others to find our content. A great option for yourself is to join our community and sign up for a personalized weekly update. Just follow the link below. My colleague Ella is in the social chat for you, so please let her know your name and the city from where you join it. She will post a link to vote up the questions that you would most like answered, and of course for you to add your own. If your question is selected, your name will appear in the credits at the end of the show, so get yours in early and stay with us to see that happen. Becoming an architect of stakeholder engagement is akin to crafting strong connections. Understand who your stakeholders are and what they need, devise a strategic plan and remain flexible in response to changes, ultimately forging enduring bonds between your vision and their support. So to help us understand what we might need to consider, let's meet our experts from around the globe for today. Hello, panel. Hello. Joining, Hello. joining us on the panel today from the UK is Sarah Hills. She's the founder of Carpe Omnia Training, a company that specializes in providing project and management training. She dedicates her time to both managing the business and delivering training with a primary focus on change management. Additionally, Sarah holds the position of chair at S3, which is the Association for Training Excellence. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Sarah. Really happy to be here, um, a subject I'm very, very passionate about. Right, thank you. Joining us from Australia is Malini Jaya Jananes, a highly experienced business relationship manager who specializes in nurturing high performing BRMs and teams. With a background in business analysis, she's regularly invited to deliver keynotes and presentations at professional and academic forums in Australia, USA, the UK, and India. Welcome back to the panel, Malini. Thank you, Stefan. I'm so delighted to be part of this conversation. And I'm looking forward to all the wonderful questions we're going to receive this hour. All right, thank you, Malini. And Sandy Lee is joining us today, also from the UK. Sandy is a seasoned program and project manager whose work includes large scale transformation programs. Working closely with senior leadership teams, Sandra focuses on helping stakeholders with journey management. Welcome to Level Up, Sandy. Hello, I'm delighted to be here and also passionate about this subject. So looking forward to being part of the debate. All right, yeah. Shola Isak is the executive director at Training Creatively in the UK, where he delivers a wide range of project and program management trainings for clients across industries. His extensive experience in delivering value to his clients and has facilitated training courses for over 5,700 delegates worldwide. Welcome back, Shola. Thank you very much, Stefan. Looking forward to contributing and learning as usual. All right, thank you. And completing our panel today is Robert Snyder. His 30-year career has included roles as a developer, database administrator, project manager, change manager, and sales enabler. He has earned PMP and Agile certifications. He's currently a solopreneur, formulating and proposing what should combat VUCA and succeed software-centric hybrid methodologies. Robert has published in Q4 2023 version of BA Digest, He's eagerly anticipating his upcoming proudest achievement late this year, which will be the publication of his new book. Hello to Chicago and welcome, Robert. 
Thank you, Stefan. I also am delighted to be here and uh, enchanted to banter about such a tricky topic with with uh, this illustrious panel. Right. Yeah. And our question master for today is Suchitra Jacob. She's APNG's operations manager for India. Welcome, Ooh. Suchitra. And may we have a first question, please. Hello, Stefan, and hi to the panelists and, of course, our viewers. Yes, of course, our first question is from Ben, who asks, when leading a change, are internal stakeholders a higher priority than external stakeholders? What a question. Okay, but we have panelists who are happy to answer. So let's start with Sarah and then Malini. Um, great question to start off with, Ben. Uh, thank you. Um, in my opinion, when leading any change, um, it's a bit dangerous to kind of say that you can prioritise internal stakeholders over external. Um, you really need to kind of just view who are your stakeholders as the first um, and foremost element. And then once you understand who they are, whether they're internal or external, think about where well, actually, you know, what what's about them, what do they represent, and then, you know, follow the bits after that. But sticking just to this question, in my view, no. Um, it will depend on every change. It may be that actually, you know, your engagement does tend to be more for internal versus external, but rule of thumb, you definitely cannot just assume that that would be the case. All right, thanks, Sarah. And Malini, may I have your view, please? Um, I, I agree with Sarah. I don't think we can go with a blanket approach that, uh, you know, any particular cohort is always going to have a higher priority over the other. Uh, you know, in some cases, for example, if it's a public sector organization uh, and if the project actually or the change is actually going to impact um, citizens, you know, they would be external to the government department that's actually leading the change. Uh, but we cannot say that, you know, the, the external stakeholders uh, are not important. After all, they are the ones that are going to be, uh, you know, that, that are going to have to live uh, and, and adapt, live with and adapt uh, to the change. So uh, I think, Ben, it will be, uh, it's better to prioritize on the basis of what's the impact of the change uh, on the stakeholder, what's the amount of uh, level of influence they have, or you can use other such uh, prioritization mechanisms. Thank you, Malini. And panel, why don't we have a look at who's out there and watching us and listening to us um, and just have a, have a view here. So there is a, a hello from Poland. Hello back to Poland from us here uh, at Level Up. Hello. And good morning from London. Hello, Antonio. Great to have you here. We also have Adrian Pine, who is actually a regular contributor to Level Up. Adrian, good to have you. Good to see you. Thank you. And there is, oh, again, Australia. I must be a fan from you, uh, Malini. There's uh, Ali from, from, from Melbourne. Um, very good. So, guys out there, just don't hesitate to raise your question to this panel. This is your chance for the next 50 minutes to do that. And, um, and see what they say, see how they can help you with their answers, okay? So let's move on, Satrichra, please, with the next question. Sure, our question next is from Ken Grant. How can I measure the effectiveness of engagement efforts with stakeholders? All right, we have Sarah starting us off and then Sandy. This is a great question, Ken, and I think this is where often people go wrong because they're brilliant sometimes at identifying stakeholders, working out a strategy of how to engage with them, get really excited about that and then forget actually how are we going to know that any of that's taken place? I've worked in so many changes where, you know, things have failed because six months down the line, it was assumed stakeholder conversations or engagement had happened and it hadn't. So I always kind of think link it with your communication strategy and remember your kind of planning around that where you do your strategy, your plan, and then you need to think about um, your actions and then after that your measurement. And it can be just as simple as if you've got an engagement, you know, stakeholders, say 10 stakeholders, 
um, thinking about how are you going to know when that engagement has happened that those 10 people have taken away what you wanted them to take away from it or what are they feeling what are their response so how are you actually going to know that those 10 people were even there that they've understood the message how they feel so just think about you know how are you going to know about that how are they going to feed back into you and that's vital throughout your initiatives how are your stakeholders throughout feeding back into it does it need to be complex it could literally be a five minute you know come on um a virtual catch up where you can really kind of see and feel what they've firm got to say but really think about how you're going to measure that and don't forget that that is the final piece of the puzzle really and then thinking about what you're going to do based on the feedback and the measurement. Good advice on measuring effectiveness. Thanks, uh, Sarah. And let's hear from uh, Sandy. Hello, yes. So building exactly on what Sarah said then, one of the things in my experience that I found to be um, often omitted uh, from communications uh, plans at the beginning uh, on how to engage stakeholders is actually thinking about the purpose of each intervention that you plan. Um, and people often think about what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, how often, but they fail to think about what they expect from that intervention. And I think that's really important. And then once you've defined that, you're in a place where you can get feedback, whether that's through questionnaires, through checking in with people, or simply from seeing whether the outcome you expected, there's evidence that it's happening. Um, so, for example, if you're expecting people to know something, you can test knowledge. If you're expecting somebody to feel something, you can do a temperature gauge. So I think one of the most important things in my experience, if you want to be able to measure it, is be clear about what you're expecting in the first place when you plan the intervention all right thanks sandy <clears throat> very good one and then there's robert thanks for the question ken <clears throat> i'd like to present a low footprint engagement survey in the form of a framework called i like i wish i hope i wonder in my uh my recommendation is that these are four questions that stakeholders don't have to answer every week but they should think about these four, four sentences every week. I like, I wish, I hope, I wonder. And specific to measurement, ideally the measurement is you have zero lack of responses, right? No one is silent. And let's, you know, let's just pick a number. If you have 40 target stakeholders that you want to guarantee or check for, 40 stakeholders to check for engagement, um, if you get 100% response to those four sentences, that is a, a great, uh, that's an encouraging sign that your stakeholders are engaged. So I'd just like to present that framework. I like, I wish, I hope, I wonder. I like, I wish, I hope, I wonder. Let's write that down. Also, um, <clears throat> if you have seen that on the screen, there was this quote about how important it is to get involved instead of just telling or showing. Okay. Great answers from this panel, thanks. Um, so Chitra, may we move on? Do we have a live question? We certainly have a live question from Adrian Pine. Some people like to pretend they're important. How do you spot fake stakeholders who waste project time? All right, okay. So this, this sounds to me like uh, <laughs> to define a stakeholder in a way, but I've seen hands raised. Let's leave it to the panel. I think Robert was first then followed by Sarah. Uh, I'm gonna point to the project plan. Hopefully, Adrian, you uh, or whoever you're asking this question on behalf of has access to the project plan because uh, these fake stakeholders, posers, um, are really frightened of an assignment on the project plan. So I believe that you need to leverage the project plan to um, uncover uh, these folks who want authority without accountability, these folks who want decision rights without decision responsibilities. Good point. Thanks, Robert. And Sarah, your view, please. Great question, Adrian. I'm in Dorset too, by the way, um, a lovely part of the world. Um, so I think it's an interesting question, isn't it? And, uh, you know, for any of us that are working in change or projects, it's 
as we know, we will be thinking about who are our stakeholders, how we're going to engage them and, you know, uh, what they represent. So I always say to people, first and foremost, it's about us, you know, uh, enabling and managing those relationships. So we should kind of be thinking about that as opposed to letting them manage us. Um, so that kind of falls into play there. But also just be mindful that, um, again, you need to kind of appreciate the stakeholders as individuals, even if they are a collective group, because some people who may be deemed as thinking they're important, but you potentially work out that they might be fake, actually, you know, they may not be through the duration of the change, but also, as we know, principle one, you forget an important stakeholder, but they won't forget you, you know, make sure we've really thought that through, actually, you know, are they going to actually potentially, you know, cause problems later if we don't actually acknowledge their input and listen to them effectively. But like I say, it's really paramount to me that we manage the stakeholders and work with them as opposed to letting them manage us. All right. Thanks. And um, I think Shola wants to add something here. Yes. Um, great question, Adrian. Um, first of all, let us look at the purpose of the project. The project is there to provide a kind of solution to a business problem. Having defined that, we then identify stakeholders, those that have got enough influence or those who are affected by the project. Once we've done that analysis, we are really easily able to spot fake stakeholders, stakeholders that are not really relevant to this particular project that will address the business problem. So identification, that is the starting point, isn't it? What is the business problem? What is the project solution? Therefore, who are the relevant stakeholders will help in sifting out those fake stakeholders. All right. Uh, thank you, Shola. So wide view um, of answers from this panel. And I would like to just jump to the next question. We are in a good move now. And hopefully we have a live question. Oh, we have a question from Milvio. Change managers are often regarded as cat herders. Yeah. What are some proven cat herding techniques? Cat herders. Now let's go for that one. Um, that sounds interesting to me. Yeah, cat herders. This is uh, or fleas, cats, <laughs> probably all the same. Uh, oh, oh, look at this. All panel panelists have raised their hands. So I, <laughs> let's start. With, I think Shola was first, and then uh, let's follow with Robert. Yes, I've heard it's pretty easy to herd goats. I've never heard of a cat either. But um, I pretty much know this. Every human or animal is pretty allergic to fire, isn't it? Even cats are. If you're able to use the burning bush technique, which emphasizes the amount of problems that we are currently facing, you will have all the cats, all your stakeholders joining you as they want to avoid the fire. The burning bush technique is um, saying that we should emphasize why we cannot continue working the way we are working now. For example, emphasizing the amount of profits we are um, not making, that is making your shareholders unhappy, emphasizing the amount of fines that um, you are incurring, affecting your reputation, emphasizing customer um, dissatisfaction. If you are able to emphasize all those problems, then the cats will certainly head together and follow you through the change journey. Thank you. Thanks, Shola. And uh, let's hear from Robert about his cat herding techniques. What came to my mind, uh, Milvio, is transparency and vulnerability. So as you are trying to move X number of cats from here to here, the more vulnerable you are, uh, probably means you're documenting a lot of things so that your stakeholders can push and pull and you documentation helps you convert personality conflict to task conflict to make decisions more pragmatic instead of personal so those those would be the the three thoughts i would have for you transparency vulnerability and documentation so that it converts personality conflict to task conflict. All right. Okay. Thanks. Great advice here. And let's hear from Sarah then. 
Okay, yeah, another great question. Um, typically, do I like the saying cat herding? No, because it kind of, again, makes us forget that people are, you know, individuals, even though working collectively. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit uh, challenging to um, what uh, Shona said, even though it's fantastic, because I think the worry is, if you're thinking about the burning bush um, analogy that you mentioned, is you don't want a pack of cats panicking and running in different directions and not really, you know, um, cause scratching if we're thinking of cats. So although that's um, a good part of it to think about, obviously we want to think about, you know, have we thought about understanding our team? So that's what I would think about with, uh, you know, bringing people together. Do we understand the individuals, which kind of picks upon what Robert was saying, actually, but just in different wordings, thinking about what the different uh, team are bringing, how can they work together? How can we facilitate that? So... Um, how they're going to have the autonomy, mastery and purpose to move forward, to feel involved, to feel part of it, how are you creating that psychological safety for them to be able to do so. And the roles and responsibilities are key as well, because there's nothing worse than people treading on each other's toes or just not understanding what each of them are there to do because we just haven't had that clarity around it. Um, and that needs to be a continuous um, thing throughout the journey. We need to understand what we're all doing, what we should be doing and how we're working collectively to get to that vision, to get to that end goal. And if there's trips along the way, there will be inevitably. But how are we going to know that and how will we overcome that as a collective team? All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sarah. And let's hear next from Malini, please. Uh, Milvio, I think we have to be really careful not to take... Um, you know, not to take a one size fits all approach. Um, so, you know, the the reference to herding cats, I think also um, implicit with that is that not everybody, uh, you know, has, uh, uh, you know, has the same reasons for responding the way they do. And some of their, uh, you know, different reasons might actually be quite legitimate. So I would approach the situation with a lot of empathy and respect and I would uh, and deep listening, and I would try to understand uh, where each person or each cohort is coming from, what is actually driving their behaviors, and then I would try to uh, rally them around, uh, you know, a common purpose uh, and and um, you know, uh, common risks that we're trying to address, and so on. Uh, but we need to be respectful of the fact that uh, of the fact that people, uh, you know, might have uh, di different reasons for for their uh, uh, different approaches to our change uh, efforts. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Malini. And uh, last on my list is Sandy for, for providing an answer. Thank you. So building on a couple of things uh, my colleagues have said, um, as Shola said, I mean, um, the burning platform analogy can create a sense of urgency if you need to get people engaged uh, quickly. But I am a great believer, a bit as Sarah said, is do we want people running away from things or do we want them running towards them? And I'm a great believer is in what I would call push rather than, uh, sorry, pull rather than push. And um, if you push things onto people, um, they'll run to run just to get away and do what you say. Whereas if you um, engage the hearts and the minds, which is harder, it takes longer. And it requires first and foremost clarity on where you're trying to go because you can only uh, get people to come with you if you're clear about that. So you need a clear vision. Um, and you need to make sure that you're engaging people, involving them. You're not doing it to people. It's something you do with people. And that for me is how you get people to come with you. You know, they say, you know, great leaders don't create great followers. They create more great leaders. And I think uh, when we want people to, to move towards a change, we need them to own it, not do it to them. So for me, it's all about engaging them and uh, creating a sense of collaboration to bring people with us. Thanks, Sandy. And Milview, you should be happy about how the panel has elaborated on your metaphor and giving you great answers. Thanks. So, Chitra, can we um, come to the next question, please? Sure. We have a question from Mary. What's a good model for identifying who your key stakeholders are? And Sorry, and key stakeholder groups are. Okay, so... Mary, you want to know about a model. Let's see what the panel can come up with some models. Oh, I think we, we uh, Robert will kick us off here. Uh, so my answer 
is more about documentation than a, than a theoretical framework or model. Identifying your key stakeholders. The first place to look is your current state documentation. If your organization has the appetite, the discipline to document current state processes, that is going to expose who your key stakeholders are. So that, although current state documentation is one of the most unglamorous things that project teams want to work on, it is so instrumental to uh, ease uh, your subsequent projects when you have that wonderful visibility of current state documentation. The other tool, the other document, of course, is a project charter and constantly being vulnerable to the stakeholder list inside your project charter and keep asking who else, who else, perpetually being vulnerable and assuming that you're missing someone and no project manager is a single point of failure. So your stakeholders, by crowdsourcing who the right stakeholders are, you maximize your chance, uh, you maximize the chance to avoid missing anyone. Yeah. Of course, you don't want to miss anyone. You don't want to have put too many people on it. I think we had that before as well. But uh, thanks, Robert. And uh, let's hear from Sarah. Um, yeah, thanks, Mary. I think, um, like I say, there's a couple of techniques, but I think the most important thing is to remember that there is actually, you know, a step-by-step -step process, although you have to stay on top of it, is that, like Robert said. Um, but first and foremost, we have to understand the definition of a stakeholder, which people forget. It's an interest in what's going you know, on or the outcome, not you know, who's impacted necessarily. So there's loads of people that might have an interest. Um, and then you know, whether you use a workshop that's well facilitated, rapid listing, which is another technique where perhaps for you introverted people, because people have a couple of minutes to come up with their own list, pair them off, um, then you know, create another list, put the pairs into groups of four, come together as a collective group, there's mind maps. So there's lots of different techniques, but remember, to always remind people that they're there to identify the stakeholders at that point. That is not the same as saying they will be engaging with them, they will be strategizing about them. So do not become overwhelmed by the enormity of how many and remind people that that is what they're there to do, the identification. And then the next part will be the segmentation, which you do with various tools. Um, you know, one of the common ones is CPIG, Customer Provider Influence and Governance. Now, Am I a massive fan? You know, I'm not going to say, but for me, it's about that transparency within your team. You know, you need to segment your stakeholders to better understand who they are. So use what works for you. Use the terminology that will work for you as long as you all understand actually what that group of stakeholders represent, because that's the next part of it. Thanks, Sarah. And let's hear from Sandy. Yes, yeah, so again, great question, Mary. And building on what um, uh, Sarah said already, I think in the categorization point, so identifying your stakeholder groups, you always need to remember you've got finite capacity. So you will always be asked to communicate more than you probably can. Um, and yet we all know it's one of the most important things we need to do. So I think involving people to understand what those groups are. And, and again, I come back to what's the purpose um, that you need to communicate to them about or involve them in. And that can be a useful way of thinking about how you categorize them um, so that you can then be more efficient and more effective in the way that you communicate with your as stakeholders. I think a well-known tool you asked about, um, a good model for knowing who they are, is, as Sarah said, think about what their interest is and what their influence is. It may be that you have some people that um, you don't need to communicate with often, but they can be highly influential, where you may have others that have much more of an interest, but are less influential. So understanding that and plotting it on a grid uh, can be very helpful, and that's a, a standard kind of stakeholder matrix. And then lastly, um, the one that's often forgotten is attitude. It's often worth ranking not only interest and influence of your stakeholders, but what's their attitude to the change? Are they people that are going to champion your change and can be therefore very helpful to you in, act in actually bringing people uh, with you? Or are they going to be blockers? Because that's something you want to know early on in the process um, so that you can actually strategize then about how to, to move potential blockers into a place where they want to walk with you. So they're kind of simple tools, but I think often simple is best at this stage and being clear on your purpose of communication with those stakeholders. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sandy. Good advice is here. 
And let's hear finally from Malini. Uh, Mary, I think one of the uh, one of the practical ways in which you can get good responses or useful responses, um, you know, when you're running workshops or, or doing mind maps uh, to identify key stakeholders, is to use uh, the IAP3 uh, spectrum, IAP2 spectrum, sorry. It's from the International Association for Public Participation. And uh, what the specs, what the spectrum does, it actually shows you uh, different levels of engagement, um, you know, that you can have with stakeholders, you know, so who are the people whom you just want to, uh, you know, keep informed or who are the people you want to uh, involve or, or consult, uh, seek input from, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so you can actually ask questions based on those different levels of engagement. So you can ask who are the people in this organization or who are the stakeholders, uh, you know, that we just need to keep informed um, and who are the stakeholders on the other hand that we actually need to, um, you know, that need to co-create um, the solution with us. Right. That might be th those sort of questions might actually trigger people's thinking uh, and you'll be able to identify uh, stakeholders that might otherwise be forgotten. Thank you, Malini. And I might like to add that we have a, a lot of uh, um, APMG accredited training organization offering a training called stakeholder engagement. You might have seen the barcode um, <clears throat> on the screen. Uh, there it is where you can. Um, actually get a lot of good techniques and methods in particular also for identifying stakeholders and uh, stakeholder groups. Thank you. And let's have a look at um, our viewers and listeners. And um, yeah, there is uh, Mercy watching us from Nigeria. Hello. Uh, good to have you here. And from Australia, we have visitors. And we also have um, a visitor from Switzerland, which is very close by, which is which is great. Um, but uh, we have a glo global panel, and we have global viewers and listeners, uh, which is great. So I I appreciate all your um, engagement here, and um, and also happy about the live questions. Do we have a live questions from this group, Suchitra? We have another live question from Adrian again. Engage or manage? Oh. How do you deal with stakeholders who want to damage or kill your project? Oh, Adrian, what a question. And um, who want to damage or kill your project, right? So the, you could ask if are these stakeholders, <laughs> has there been any mistake identifying them? I don't know. But let's hear from our panel. I think Robert was first, then Sandy, Sarah. I'd like to lean into the martial art of Aikido, which is known for exaggerating your opponent's momentum when attacked. So, uh, Adrian, my, my three bullet response to you is number one, be ridiculously transparent about what your saboteur has in mind. Uh, be very transparent. Number two, exaggerate their momentum. And number three, find, because they're not accountable to you or the project, find who they are actually accountable to, because formally or informally, they have a sponsor, and that is who they will be accountable to. So I recommend that you exaggerate the saboteur's momentum into their sponsor. All right. Thanks, Robert. Uh, and Adrian here, there, there are your three, of, three advices, three bullets. Let's hear next from Sandy. Okay, so uh, um, interesting building on on uh, those points that I always think uh, one important thing about stakeholders is don't be afraid of your stakeholders. Sometimes it may be they have something useful to say and openness is about, um, you know, if we think of transparency as a right to information and, and most stakeholders expect uh, that. Openness is about a right to participation and sometimes we need to be willing to hear and to listen. So my view is don't be afraid of it. Often uh, what can appear as as um, someone wishing to kill the project actually represents perhaps a worry or a concern that may not be true. And so a little bit like the phrase, you know, keep your uh, friends close and your enemies closer, is seek to understand. And sometimes I think we focus more on what we want to say than actually allowing the dialogue to, uh, to unfold. 
unfold and being willing to adapt um, and therefore get to the end game together. So it may be that you do have somebody you need to control, et cetera, but my first step would be seek to listen um, and understand whether there is something that can be easily diffused um, or, or whether it's something that is more, um, more material than that. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, thanks. Sandy, and let's hear from Sarah next. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Um, yeah, I, I, it's tricky to say engage or manage, really, isn't it? But first and foremost, like the other two have said, you know, we need to understand, you know, what's the motive behind wanting to damage or kill the project? Because there will be a reason. So let's just use our common sense and have that conversation and find out why. But then let's also, exactly like Robert said, you know, are you the right person to tackle that? Probably not, but you need to kind of raise it because it's going to prevent your change or your projects happening. So, you know, love that. You know, make sure the sponsor or whoever is accountable for that individual group of people is aware and they have the skills to tackle it because, again, that's often what's forgotten. But they know how to have those tough conversations. And something I do say for years when we talk about kind of assistance or tricky people it has been a bit of a kind of advisory point that you get them involved you get them to lead on certain things now if they are going to be great potentially but I kind of move away from that in a sense because again culturally it kind of implicitly says that we're actually going to kind of um, enable people that are going to speak a bit louder or are going to cause a bit of fuss to actually have key roles so you know really kind of uh, manage it on an individual basis but i think it's an element of engaging and managing the situation but who are the right people to do those elements but again we want the people involved ultimately and if we don't need them or if they don't need to be involved then again you know we need to tackle that appropriately all right thanks thanks sarah and uh let's hear from shola yes um the first question is quite interesting are we engaging or managing stakeholders uh, building on what was said earlier on we should be engaging because nobody likes being managed. We should engage stakeholders, get their viewpoints on what the business problem is again, get their viewpoints, get them to actively come up with the solution and also involve them during the projects and business changes that we are making as we achieve new ways of working using the project solution. So we should not be coming to them with the solution. They should actually come up to us with what is best fit, what we yield value for all relevant stakeholders in a prioritized manner, of course. Now, why do stakeholders want to damage or kill the project? We should investigate that reason. I um, confirm what my fellow panelists are saying. Probably there are better reasons. We are moving many stakeholders from their comfort zone. Some stakeholders are getting what we call these benefits, isn't it? from the change that we are trying to deliver. But how can we reach a consensus? How can we accommodate their views if they are really influential stakeholders that can affect the project or the change? We need to work with, with our stakeholders. One thing we must not do is we never ignore such stakeholders or any other important stakeholders um, for that regard. Thank you. Thanks, Shola. And um, I think we should just move on to the next question, Adrian. I think you are, you should be happy. <laughs> so we have another live question from Chinedu Anthony. Is it good to privately engage stakeholders who show difficulties in understanding what you're engaging the stakeholders in the group? All right. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> that sounds like a difficult question, but uh, I leave it to the panel. And I think Malini was first, uh, followed by Shola and then Robert. Uh, so, Chinero, so if you have a stakeholder who has difficulty in understanding, you know, um, you know the matter at hand, so the, the reason why you're engaging in, and so on, or uh, whether it's someone who's actually um, dem displaying some challenging behaviors. Uh, I think a, a good way to start would be to engage with them um, privately, so you know, uh, away from away from other stakeholders, because then you can um, you're demonstrating respect, and you can uh, you know sort of try to cultivate some uh, try to cultivate their trust in you, right? Um, and and you you're being uh, patient as well. 
but I think you have to be really careful when you have these uh, offline engagements with specific stakeholders that you're not inadvertently adding to the, you know, the, the political uh, chaos that, that that might be happening in your project. So uh, try to see if you can actually bring some transparency by maybe taking the, the key concerns they have and, and bringing that to other stakeholders for, for discussion um, so that, you know, uh, you're out of those private conversations, there's some good uh, that can come for everyone. Okay, thanks, Malini. So it's a yes with a but. Um, and that's what I understand. Um, <clears throat> let's hear next from Sholad. Hi, I... Um... I agree with what Malini said. There will be some stakeholders that you need to spend some particular private time with because of the level of influence they have, their relevance to the project or to the change. But you should be careful in doing that. Other stakeholders might fail. Why are you not spending that amount of private time with us as well? But in assessing your stakeholders, of course, you'll be coming up with the best appropriate um, engagement strategy for the different individual or group of stakeholders. And that assessment should confirm who to engage privately or not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, thanks, uh, Shola. And uh, let's hear next from Robert. Stefan, I was delighted that you interpreted Malini's response as yes, but, because what I was thinking was yes and, the art of improv. <laughs> so I believe the answer to this question is absolutely yes. Any opportunity you have for stakeholder intimacy and deep uh, connection and listening, I think that's a fantastic opportunity to probe. And, and the words in improv are called explore and heighten. Explore and heighten. So when a stakeholder has that much vulnerability and curiosity that they're willing to raise their hand and say, mm, I don't follow this. That is an amazing opportunity to really explore and heighten with that stakeholder. Yeah, if they raise their hand, there's a relief. <laughs> I suppose. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> so Chitra, let's move on to the next question. Sure. We have a question from Mark, another live question. I have a limited engagement with stakeholders as my manager or product team typically handles these relationships. How can I increase my engagement with them? All right. Um, so if you're not too close to stakeholders, how can you engage with them? I think Sandy was first followed by Molini. Okay, so I mean, first of all, it's not a uh, great question, Mark, and um, not knowing exactly what your role is, but actually that raises a really important question in itself, which is we need to be clear, it's not a singular responsibility, stakeholder management. Um, and therefore, one key aspect is being clear on who has that accountability and what are the different roles that we all play in stakeholder management in, in uh, moving to people to a change. So it's worth clarifying that so that it's clear what your role can be versus that of your uh, product team or your um, your manager. The other thing I said is a great book. Um, it was published in 2001 um, called The Trusted Advisor. And it still has a lot of validity today to me, which is about thinking first about your credibility, the words that you say. Why should people listen to you? What's your specialism? And um, uh, your reliability, which is your actions. What, what is it that you do? Because people will look for uh, backup. And then it talks about intimacy, which is creating an environment where uh, others are comfortable to talk with you. So have you developed that relationship? Because at its heart, stakeholder engagement is about relationship. And lastly, then, um, what they call self-orientation, which is can you demonstrate that you care? And those th things, uh, I've given you a very small uh, um, a summary there, but great book to read and a really good way to think about how you can develop those skills. All right. Thanks, uh, Sandy, for summarizing um, <clears throat> the book. That would, would be <laughs> helpful. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's move on to uh, Malini. Mark, firstly, I want to say uh, good on you, as we say in Australia, for having an interest in, in stakeholder engagement and wanting to take on more of those engagement responsibilities. Um, you should absolutely have a conversation with your uh, manager, 
um, you know, or the the product, um, you know, product uh, owner or, or team leader uh, about where you might be able to help. Uh, and part, they might be willing to give you some opportunities. You might also have to demonstrate that you have the, uh, you know, the competencies required. And so the book that Sandy recommended is is a is definitely a very useful resource. You might also consider um, undertaking some training, for example, APMG's Business Relationship Management Professional uh, Certification, where we actually cover um, you know various aspects of relationship building, such as um, you know communication, building trust, uh, you know building partnerships, and that sort of thing, which I think uh, you know will be great to have in your toolkit if this is an area of continued interest for you. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Malini. Certainly is one of me, one of, has been one of mine, or it still is. That's why I'm a BRMP, so I love that, and I know exactly what you're talking about. It's great guidance there. Um, thanks. <clears throat> then let's hear from Sarah. Hi, Mark. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, because I don't know enough to know whether your management or product team are the best place people to actually be having those engagements um, with these stakeholders. Because obviously, you know, some people are best engaged by others. So it's kind of niggling at me to think and challenge, actually, would someone like yourself perhaps be best placed to engage with some of those stakeholders or would other people um, be best placed? So going back really to... Um, what a couple of the panelists said, I would then like say, just have that open conversation. Think about your own influence, your own credibility and start that conversation with your manager. Don't shy away from it. Find out why that is and see how you can become involved um, and just, you know, be brave enough to kind of do that. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah. And let's uh, hear at last from Robert. Mark, I'm going to interpret your question as a matter of feeling more excluded than included. And I'm going to take a very formal stance on being included has a direct line to the project plan. So for example, let's say at the moment, feeling excluded, your name appears in the project plan five times. And what, what might qualify as healthy inclusion for you, healthy engagement with these stakeholders, is that your name appears on the project plan 10 times. So I'm just going to draw, uh, just bring out the importance of the formality of the project plan and the leverage that uh, just assignments have for you to be, to be and feel more included. All right. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, panel. And Mark, I hope um, you, you got, got a very good view on uh, and replies on your question. So, Chitra, we have time for more questions. Sure, we have another live question from Milio. With business change, is it better to focus on disengaged stakeholders first? Okay, I think I have an idea why Malini have raised her, has raised her hand <laughs> immediately when she saw that question. Um, so Malini, it's you first and then followed by Sarah. Um. Well, I don't know whether whether you have mind reading skills, Stefan, but uh, Milvio, uh, it it depends on where you want to, uh, you know, where you want to focus first. But generally speaking, I actually prefer to focus on the highly engaged stakeholders first because then I can enroll them as advocates to engage those who are disengaged, so that I don't have to put all the effort by myself, uh, you know, to to rally around people who are not interested in this. All right, good point. Yeah, I don't have mind reading skills, but I knew what you would say. <laughs> For some reason, let's uh, let's uh, move on to Sarah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, again, you know, you have to look at the change that you're working on. But is it better to focus on disengaged stakeholders first? Um, not necessarily, no. And it kind of goes back to what I said earlier in one of the responses about that cultural element. People are savvy. They pick up on things. And if it looks like actually that's what you're doing and you want that trust, that relationship, you know, it's, you know, it's not necessarily the best route to go. So, you know, I think we need to think about, you know, who should we be engaging with and how can we engage with as many of those people, whether they're disengaged or engaged, because exactly like Malini said, the principle of all of this is you aren't doing it all. 
or I hope you're not doing it all, you are thinking about who are the best people to be part of your change agent network to actually go out to these people, disengaged or engaged, to get those relationships flowing. Oh, good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah. And let's hear from Shola. Okay, we can't hear you, Shola, unfortunately. Um, so I would like to um, <clears throat> come um, to a close because we have um, um, basically time's running out for us. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank our producers for the excellent questions that came in today. It's actually like uh, very often there are more there were more questions that we could handle. So, but it's a great job. Watch out for your name in the credits if your question was selected. Hannah, it's time for your closing remarks. So why don't you give a few statements on what you still want to say, and what advice you want to give to people who are listening to us. Um, so I might start in reverse order um, with Robert first. Thank you, Stefan. One of my favorite quotes is, Execution's two best friends are simplicity and transparency. I believe that can be a very powerful quote for stakeholder engagement. The other point I'd like to make is vulnerability. It's easy to say. Uh, it's, a, it's a term that's thrown around quite a bit. Stakeholder engagement is a great place for exercising vulnerability. I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right. Thanks, Robert. Good point. Vulnerability. And I heard you saying that before. It's a very important topic. Okay, let's hear closing remarks from Shola. Unfortunately, Shola, we, can, we, we still can't hear you. Um, I don't know where that comes from, so I'm sorry. I have to move on to Sandy. Okay, so I think for me, Stephen Covey once referred to trust as being a performance multiplier. And I think for me, when thinking about how we build relationships, it's really think about how you can build trust with the people that you want to engage with. It will help with a communication, it will help with collaboration, and it will help with execution. So that would be my last words, I think, in this particular conversation. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Sandy. And we hear next from uh, from Malini. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, on the show. And I was very excited to see the viewers from Australia and New Zealand, um, and of course around the world. We, uh, for, for much of this show, we, we were talking about stakeholder engagement in the context of uh, project management or change management. But I'd like to draw uh, your attention to business relationship management, which is, uh, you know, where we try and focus on creating the relationship-centered organization so that everything we do actually is uh, with a relationship lens, right? It's about building building that trust and credibility so that, uh, you know, across all, all our efforts, all our projects, all our change efforts, uh, we actually work more collaboratively. So do have a look at the website of the Business Relationship Management Institute. For more information. Okay, thanks. Good advice. Uh, Malini, <clears throat> let's hear then from Sarah. Uh, thank you again for having me and always I feel so privileged to be with the other panellists. I always get so much from you as well. So thank you um, as well as the audience. Um, so I just, you know, stakeholder really is, you know, key, isn't it? Just like the others have all alluded to. But I always just keep it really simple as well and think, well, it's people's lives. So why, you know, if it's people's lives that we're talking about, that there's going to be an impact or they're going to have an interest in either way, why wouldn't we actually just respect that and think about what's their voice? How are they going to be as part of this, you know, and actually get them involved? Because actually it's pretty ignorant if we don't. It's, you know, basic human manners, really. Hmm. Okay. Well, good point. Uh, thanks. And uh, maybe we'll give it another try, uh, Shola, for your closing remark. Uh, and that is an unfortunately <laughs> that, that attempt has failed again. Um, so I, but thanks panel for being here and great 
Um, great, really well done, everyone, for all your good answers. Um, this is episode 199. So our next milestone is going to be reaching soon. Can you imagine 200 of these shows with all these many questions and they're all available mm -hmm. to you? There are more than 2,000 questions plus all the answers. Um, it's a free resource connecting you with experts from around the world. You can search on our website and you will find answers from each and every panelist for each and every questions that ever has been raised. So don't miss that opportunity. For the show today, you can also listen to the audio versions of today on your preferred podcast platform. So it's not just on YouTube. Coming up Friday on the 3rd November at 2 p.m. UK time, we actually proudly present our episode 200 where we discuss how to become a project manager. And next Monday on the 6th of November, we will join you at 8 a.m. GMT for a lively discussion on how to build a strong business case. Please sign up and we will send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you too can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. Thanks everyone. Everyone outside there, all the viewers, listeners, thanks to the panel, and see you on the next show.